I'd like to now introduce um, Dr. Deb Ellis. Debbie is a senior lecturer at, at, in education at Deakin University in Melbourne. She's worked in the health, physical education and sexuality education field for over 30 years as a secondary school teacher, policy officer, curriculum consultant, in curriculum writing, teacher education and as a researcher. Her teaching and research interests intersect the area of sexuality education, gender, respectful relationships education, and that includes gender-based violence education, <coughs> health and wellbeing. <coughs> Debbie has a long history in the translation of her own and others' research into practice through policy, teacher professional learning, teacher education, and the development of school-based curriculum in health and sexuality education. She's been principal author of two Australian sexuality education frameworks and a number of sexuality education resources. She's worked in policy and program development in health, gender and sexuality education in the state, national and international arena for the last 25 years. She's an active researcher in the sexuality education field, currently working independently and collaboratively on capacity building in sexuality education, the implementation of respectful relationships intervention, pre-service teacher sexuality programs, and most recently on an Australian Research Council linkage project with colleagues from Uni South Australia and Shine South Australia, researching young people's experience of and voice in sexuality education. So we're very, very fortunate to have Debbie come over to Perth, um, and I'd like to invite her to come and present her session. So as you can see, I've been around for a while. I just hope I don't fall off the back of here. Um, I don't actually think I actually need the, um, the microphone. We'll see how I go. If I stand here, you won't see me. Um, OK, as you can see, I've been asked to talk about building capacity uh, in, in sexuality education. And I'm going to uh, overwhelmingly talk about the Northern Bay experience, which is a five-year project designed to build a whole school approach to sexuality education. But I'm actually going to draw on a number of the research projects that I've been involved in, in terms of this presentation, because it can be a bit dry just looking at a whole school approach to anything. And a lot of you people are from schools, so I don't probably need to tell you what a whole school approach is because you do it um, all the time. So let's just, um, st now, this is where the technology, Let's just have a look at, um, is it going to work? I guess I'll never know what I missed on the first day of health class. Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. Don't have sex in a missionary position, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it, promise? Okay, everybody take some rubbers. <laughs> okay, so that's a sort of message. Now, let's see where the... How do I go back to it? Is that it? Yep. I wanted to let everyone know that we have a oh, uh, new student joining us. This is exactly what I feared. OK, how do I turn Welcome. that off? <laughs> I'm from Michigan. I came with the Mac, so some of the technology is a bit... Thank you. And back to... Okay, so that's a, that's a sort of message that we that young people often get in sexuality education. And I guess I want to start this presentation by us having a common understanding of what we mean by comprehensive sex and relationships education. So, for those people who are from the health and phys ed area and and from. Um, uh, Sharon's and Lisa's presentation, uh, I gather that that is the context in Western Australia under which sexuality education is taught. Now this is the definition of sexuality that's being used in the national curriculum and it is a far cry from that short uh, snippet out of Mean Girls around abstinence. What we see here are issues around eroticism sexual orientation, pleasure, intimacy, as well as some of the traditional areas that sexuality education has covered. We look at things like fantasies, desires, and then if you look at the last statement in the context of social, historical and, and uh, political considerations. Now, for anybody who's worked in this area for, you know, and, and there's probably many people in here who have been teaching in this area as long as I have, 
there's been a real shift over time to acknowledge what is positive about sexuality and to move away from the um, focus on risk and harm. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But, and I guess what we need to acknowledge is that the teaching of, of this does reside in the health and visit area. And my view is it is the hope of change. And I'm not here to talk about that today, but um, my own research shows that it, it is how we are going to bring about change because we're going to be um, uh, training and educating males as well as female teachers to to take up the task of sexuality education as well as our generalist, um, as well as our generalist teachers. Um, I, I sent an email this week from a student at Monash University who, um, who said to me, you know, thanks for replying and explaining your research. I'm looking at the differences between what students encounter online in popular <coughs> culture with school-based learning about sexuality and gender and how the two can be integrated. This is such a fascinating area. I wish that teachers from other subject areas could teach um, sexuality. And, and, I, and I put that up there because uh, that, that's the case. The health and phys ed teachers, it is their area. It's a wonderful, exciting space to be in. And, um, and we're very lucky for, for that to be our um, area. We just have to make sure that our teachers feel confident. Um, before I start to talk about the Northern Bay experience, I just would like to contextualise this in the current research around sex and relationships education. And it's interesting that both Sharon and Lisa have already pointed to a few of these points already. We know that sex and relationships education is implemented ad hocly in schools, and, and that is a, a, across, the, a, across the country. Very little is taught from prep, prep to, year, um, to year four, um, we also know from the National School Survey, and I think it was Lisa who uh, alluded to that, is that school-based programs are the most trusted and used source of information for young people. That's where they want to, to learn information, and the work that we're doing as part of the ARC research is showing exactly the same thing. So young people use and trust the information they get from schools. It's not always what they want, but, they, but that's what they trust. There is a lack of a gender lens. And if we go back to that definition of sexuality from WHO, which is used in the, the national, the Australian, Australian <laughs> curriculum, um, there are a range of issues that require our young people to explore issues on the basis of gender. And most resources and, and most programs and schools fail to do that. Um, in terms of gender and sexual diversity, there has been huge change over the last 15 years around sexual diversity, and we're starting to see huge change. But gender is a real issue, and gender diversity is a real issue. In Victoria, we have a number of young people who are transitioning, and transitioning in primary schools. So we need to have inclusive programs. You can't teach puberty the way you used to teach it, and say that there is this um, sequence that is for everybody, because it's not the case. So how are you going? to um, have, uh, provide education that is inclusive of those issues um, and it, to make sure that we are inclusive of, of all young people. There is a mitch, mismatch between what teachers uh, want to teach and what they teach and what young people uh, want to learn and how they want to learn and that's part of the research that I'm involved in at, at the moment which really moves into the next point. One of the things that the, we've just been running some uh, research workshops based on um, the results of our survey, and, and that's what young people are saying. All they ever get is how bad sex is. It's all about harm, it's all about risk, it's all about disease. And I know from a, having been in, in a department, you know, there are political reasons why we have to roll out the, um, the, the, you know, the data but it doesn't do our young people any disservice for them to, to, to constantly think that this is a really negative. There's wonderful positive aspects of sexuality and, and we need to be uh, covering that as well. Very rarely do programs cover issues around intimacy, desire, sexual pleasure. And again, these are the sorts of issues that are really important that, that young people say they want to, they want to cover. 
Uh, there's a need for education to navigate the internet, and I don't need to go into that. You're, you're all aware of, of the data and the real concern we have around um, young people accessing very violent pornography. Uh, and I think as it might have been Sharon talked about, you know, teachers do lack confidence uh, and, and skill and a willingness to cover the more sensitive issues, but that's because they haven't had the education to do it. We don't expect maths teachers to, to cover particular things without having the training to do it. And, and it's even more important when it involves some moral and ethical issues um, as well. Um, we know that well-developed curriculum resources um, and innovative approaches uh, improve young people's engagement. And um, the final point there, we know that engaging young people as participants and finding out what and how they want to learn um, it also in, increases uh, engagement. But what I've been asked to talk about today um, is a whole school approach to... Um, to sexuality education and I'd just like to show you another little YouTube to just get us in the mood for, for those sort of partnerships that we have in a whole school approach. And anybody who's seen bad education? Well, I voted her off in the first round. But Alice is my daughter. Hasn't she got nice eyes? Mm. You're a lovely girl. Lovely Alice. And it's going to be worse than when the exchange students arrive. I don't want some predator in a beret groping my daughter. Mrs Lithgow, if it's any consolation, I think twinkly-eyed Alice will be very low down on their list. <laughs> no, that appears to have made it worse. Look, you're all squabbling over what is the most beautiful part in bringing up a child. We have to work together to help our kids embrace the changes that are going on inside their body. <laughs> I know it's some sense. But I think it's really important that we make a stand. You, my turn. Um, just wanted to throw this one out there. If any of the staff, or indeed mums, that are under the age of 40, unless they're proper fit, <laughs> want to come and draw on my wealth, Sexual. You know what I'm going to do. How can I trust this moron with teaching my children something as important to sex education? I can assure you we are more than qualified to deal with this. Perhaps some of the parents might like to sit in on a class. Mr Wickers, yeah. you'd be happy with that, wouldn't you? Um, uh... Alfie? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, fine. Yeah, cool. Share the knowledge. Feel the force. I'm like a... Sex, no <laughs> <laughs> How many times don't you have? <laughs> <laughs> Top-notch Jedi banter. <laughs> <laughs> I voted off in the first round. All right, now let's see if I can get rid of the technology a bit. Yep, good. And... Okay, so uh, look, I just think that's a bit of a fun way of looking at the range of issues that we, I guess, we refer to around a whole school approach. How we engage parents, you know, the qualifications of the teachers, you know, the, the fears around what's going to be taught. Um, and it's just, uh, and, and if people haven't seen bad education, I was going to show you another scene, which is just fantastic, which is actually in the classroom where those parents come to, um, to yeah. watch. So it's well worth a, a watch if you haven't seen it. Now look, I've just, um, I guess, modified. This is an approach that we have, to, a whole school approach that we're using around um, uh, gender-based violence, uh, around respectful relationships. and. Uh, for, uh, most of the people here are from schools, from what I understand, so you're aware of these key components, but I think it's worth being reminded that if we are going to build a whole school approach, we need to look at the environment, the school environment. We need to um, make sure that there is leadership and commitment. Uh, professional development is really important, which is what's uh, being um, involved today, teaching and learning, what goes on in the classroom, community partnerships and support for staff. So, you know, it, it, a whole school approach is, is looking and making sure that we build all of those areas. But what I'm talking about today is our experience at Northern Bay College. And this is a five-year project 
uh, designed to build a whole school approach to sexuality education. It began in 2010 and we're in 2015 now, and so we're, um, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but we're just in the process of going back into the school and doing a, a lot of research on, on that experience. But it probably, from, from my search of the literature, there are very few schools that actually have a whole school approach to sexuality education, maybe around health, but this is dedicated to sexuality education. And it came about because the school um, had to go through a huge regeneration project. It's in one of the lowest SES areas in Victoria. Um, there were six primary schools and two secondary schools which were brought together into a huge P to 12 college. Now you can imagine uh, for those people who've been in schools and been through those sorts of changes, you can imagine how difficult it was for the schools as they were being forced to, to, to come together under this process. But what it provided was an opportunity to really explore what was going on in the school. So, and at that point, um, uh, regional um, and local health services did the classic come in in grades five and six and do the puberty talk to, to, the, um, to the grades five and six in a couple of the six campuses. There was a Dachshund team project that was covered, taken by a nurse in one of the secondary schools. So it was that ad hoc approach. There was no education from prep, prep to four and what was going on in secondary schools was basically elective. And so the Regional Health Service um, came to the school and at the same time a couple of parents uh, contacted the principal and said, look, we're really worried about our, our grade six students going to be, because they were, one of the structures of, of the new school was that, that the learning teams, there was a was one to two, three to five and then a six to eight. And so these parents were worried about th these young as their, their young uh, sons and daughters being with older kids. So it provided the catalyst to start to, to think about, well, what would it look like? What would it look like if we had a whole school approach to sexuality education? Because of, there was also a lot of the statistics that Lisa talked about are very evident, and I'm trying to stay away from the negatives here, but they were very evident. Um, the school has a crash because of how uh, how high the teenage pregnancy rates is. So um, it's one, one of uh, the few schools in Victoria that has a crash, so um, rates of STIs are very high, um, very high Indigenous community, lots of cultural diversity. So there's lots of challenges there. So the, the school took this challenge and said, OK, let's take a community partnership approach and we'll build a, a comprehensive approach to sexuality education, which is what they've been uh, engaged in. So I guess I, I, I'm going to sort of concentrate on the first couple of years and then talk about where we are now. But one of the most important things was creating readiness. And I know that anybody who's been involved in any change in schools, it's absolutely crucial to make sure that you create an environment where people are ready for change. You can't just uh, put it on them. So it was a partnership between um, the schools, the education department, um, the local and regional health services, um, family planning in Victoria and Deakin University. So a working party um, was formed and with those key people as well as key um, staff from each of the, um, of the five campuses. So, and really that uh, working party was designed to really build awareness and also motivation in terms of bringing about uh, this change. And, and after a couple of meetings, it became evident that different people on that working party could take different roles. And I was originally asked just because of my, I guess, my work in sexuality education, my background. But once myself and my colleague, Lynn Harrison, were on that working party, we said, look, why don't we do the research for you? So we're involved in helping them in other ways. But so each of those um, partners sort of took a role. So it, it was really important. And they met, on, we met on a monthly basis for the first um, two years. The other really important thing was the development of an action plan. And this was a five year project. So we're just in year one at this point. So this whole year, one whole year was just spent in developing the approach, in creating the readiness, in starting to talk about these things in the school. Um, and so, and as I said, the school was going through enormous change. 
The other thing that was really important was there were two key champions to start with. One was the health promotion officer from Barwon House, and the other one was one of the, the um, principals from one of the campuses. So they both were, the, so there were two champions working and supporting uh, the, the development of, of this approach. And the, um, the quote there is from the community uh, health uh, promotion worker who said, her motivation is to step out, that's my motivation, it's to put the college in a position where they don't have to ring me, where they don't have to seek me as an expert, where they don't have to see themselves as needing help from a health agency. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but that's exactly what happened. Okay, so the, and the other really crucial part of creating readiness and, and is that idea of having some data and, um, and, and, and research. And, I, and if one of the things that have changed in the sexuality education area over the time that I've been working in it is the need for evaluation. And so that's on the agenda now. There's projects are building this in because we need the evidence. The National Schools data has been absolutely crucial to anybody working in this space. Every resource I've written, you know, you take what research and you develop it because that's the only information we have from young people to say this is what we need. Um, or, or from teachers, so it's really important that we have that. So in the first instance, we surveyed all the teachers about what they thought was important in sexuality education. We surveyed the parents to begin with in um, grades five and six, and we surveyed the students uh, in grades five and six. And the reason that was the case to begin with, because when the project began, that's all they were going to do. They were only going to look at grades five and six as a starting point. So, so that data was absolutely crucial in, in looking at uh, and providing some guidance. Um, it also provided guidance for professional learning. So in, that, in, in the second year, at the end of the second year, um, 28 teachers were involved in a two-day professional learning um, uh, event, but they were from P to year eight. And so what came out of that was, was the teachers, they said, why are we doing this in grades five and six? We should be starting this in prep which is what we call it in Victoria. So that, so providing the uh, teachers um, and other support people who were working with teachers with the relevant data on what young people were saying and, and their own experience, they said, no, let's start it, let's start it uh, in prep. They developed a policy. So you go onto their website and there's a policy on sexuality education along with their other policies in education. So it's clearly there. You're sending your kids there, that there's a policy. The other thing was the importance of parent and community consultation. There were five um, parent uh, information evenings where parents came along and we talked about the research as well as the approach of the school. Uh, there were parents on the working party and then in the third year, there were students on the working party, so um, uh, that as well. So, and, and so in that second year, the program development be began. So we're at the end of year two, and there's no teaching. So, so this is all about creating readiness. So that it can't just, it just doesn't happen um, overnight. So if we looked at some of those earlier challenges, it was about a common understanding and purpose. And that working party, there was some differences. So, and there was some tension to begin with, which had to be worked through. But there has to be a common understanding about what's going on here. So, and it has to be um, uh, clearly understood, and the values are clearly understood. We lost one of the champions in year two, and we thought that that was going to be a disaster, but it didn't. The, uh, uh, the, it was a school champion, but another school champion uh, stepped up. The, the, the champions were crucial in providing advice and support the whole time for particularly the teaching staff in, in, in those early couple of years. Um, the parental engagement, this is really a low SES, and trying to get the parents engaged was really difficult. Um, and in the end, we had a parent liaison person to work with the parents, but we tried really hard to get our Indigenous parents involved and, and couldn't. One of the things, we had it's a very large Karen Burmese population, 
So the survey that went to parents was translated into Karen and we had one parent information night just for them with an interpreter. So, because if you're going to really do this properly in terms of a whole school approach, you must have the partnership with your parents. I mean, we know particularly in those early years for, for kids, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the first educated sexuality education are parents. So it has to be um, a partnership, but that was a challenge. Um, there was a, a range of cultural and religious sensitivities that needed to be dealt with and one of the teachers is going to talk to you in a, a little bit later uh, about how you know, we work with that. Making it comprehensive, moving it away from just puberty moving it into the sorts of issues that the um, Australian curriculum is identifying and the World Health Organisation is saying should be in sexuality education. It's because it's much more comfortable to teach facts. But when you have to explore um, moral and ethical issues with kids, which is what they want to explore, um, it, it's much more sensitive. So uh, the, the training was absolutely crucial. There was um, structural differences between primary and secondary and, and you people are aware of those. You know, you've got generalist teachers and then all of a sudden we've got our specialist teachers and so that provides uh, challenges particularly in secondary schools in terms of a whole school approach. Uh, and moving away from a model that relies on school nurses going into classrooms and agencies coming in. Because all the research tells us that the best people to teach sexuality education are the teachers. They have the relationships, ongoing relationships with the kids. They have, are experts in curriculum. They are experts in assessment. They, and they're not one off. Um, the work that we're doing with, um, some, another project I'm working on is looking at respectful relationships and the, that's what the young people are saying. It's too sensitive. You can't have somebody just come in and cover this stuff. So, um, the other most important thing is the patience. Uh, it takes um, it takes a long time. So we're in 2015 now, um, and uh, at this point, the, the Northern Bay has a curriculum that spans prep to ten. So and. Uh, as I said, we're about to go in and actually have a, ha have a look at that. And um, it's, it's interesting, so on paper things can sometimes look a bit different to uh, what they are in reality. And I've just worked with some of the kids from Northern Bay and I uh, was thinking, oh, well, maybe they haven't quite got the education that, um, that it looks like on paper. But they, they do have, it's a real shift from, from um, as I said, that ad hoc approach that was taken not by the teachers, but by taken by outside agency. It's now um, a, a program that's taught from prep to year 10 by, um, by teachers with support from agencies. Um, ongoing professional learning from staff for staff. So there, they still have, say, family planning may come in and do some PD. I've done some PD for the teachers, but the teachers are running PD for the staff as well. So there's been real capacity building around um, a group of teachers uh, in that school. Uh, and there, so, and as you know, with schools, you know, new staff, people move on, and every year they provide some professional development. The other thing is there's a dedicated um, leader who's a teacher who has higher duties to, to, to look after sexuality education in the school. And what happened at the end of year three, the community agency champion, just left and the school, and it was a school decision that, that they would be now taken over by the school. So, and as we know, if we are going to um, have sustainable sexuality education, then it needs to be integrated into the school. It needs to be um, being conducted and supported uh, by, by the school. Uh, there are um, parent and community support. So if you go to Northern Bay, there's just an expectation um, around uh, sexuality education. You have people often talking about uh, uh, their, uh, their role. Uh, different health agencies talk about the work that they do there. There's been a lot of public um, recognition um, and, and marketing, uh, school and community partnerships to support, and, and the ongoing res research is, is going on. But as I said, we don't know what that data is going to show. We're just about to survey all of the teachers, all of the parents from prep to 12, um, all the kids, and then we're going to do some, uh, and the stakeholders are going to do some qualitative research. So that's going to take us another six months to collect that data. But I guess it's about sustainability. 
because uh, it's you know one-off projects we, we know don't don't work. So, what has built that sustainability? It, one, it, one of the key issues has been the um, dissemination of what's going on, the data. So the school celebrates sexuality education. So they have um, events that celebrate the work that's going on in the school, where you know they, they invite the, the mayor of Geelong, for example, came to to one of their um, forums. You know they, they invite um, a range of agencies in to showcase it. They showcase that they they've got this this approach. Um, they also applied for grants. They won a, uh, an NAB grant which enabled them to have a parent liaison person. So that was, you know, really building the relationships with, with quite a, a difficult parent base. Um, the majority of the parents uh, are not in paid employment, so it's a really difficult um, area in, in uh, that area of Geelong. Um, acknowledgement and resourcing by the leadership, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, but um, that the, the um, principal of the school, he goes all over the country now talking about the experience, not, not just um, in Victoria, and he'll go to any little forum, uh, and so and he really celebrates the work that the school does and the, the work that his teachers do. The, the role of the um, research cannot be underestimated and what we did over that course of that time was involve the, the um, teachers in action research where they were involved in collecting data from their own kids and because so, we wanted to build their capacity when we leave this year to be able co to continue to collect data so that they can improve their programs. So um, that's been uh, a really in important part of that. Supported risk taking, by that I mean is supporting teachers to take risks to do things like something on sexual pleasure or to, to do something on sexual practices so that they have um, some support to try it and then they have an opportunity to debrief on, on that because we know often from teachers it's more about the fear of what's going to happen rather than the reality. Um, so it's providing support to take those sorts of risks. Um, community engagement, as I said before, it's involving the community so that it is a, a greater ownership than, than just the school. And, and the most crucial aspect of all is the ongoing professional uh, development. So now I'm just going to. Um, this is the. This is one of the. This is the person talking here. Is the um, teacher who leads it now in the school? Is it going to work. Our approach is a whole school approach, um, so we're a multi-campus college and we're trying to get all campuses from prep to year 12 running the sexuality education program. Whole school approach means having representatives from each age and stage attend uh, monthly to six weekly meetings to ensure that we're all consistent with our approach to sexuality education and it means that every campus, every child in our college it, um, has some form of sexuality education. Okay, so we really wanted a strong parent involvement um, because they're important to the, pro the success of the program uh, because the kids do take work home as well. Um, so we ran a number of parent information sessions. We also did some parent surveys. Each of the parents ran a survey um, and just to find out how comfortable they were with different aspects of sexuality education and the results were quite interesting and, and we were able to use those to sort of plan where we would go to next. In terms of cultural diversity, we, we try to include as much as we like. We try to include as many students and their families as possible. So running, and we know that there's certain religious beliefs and things like that. So that's why we ran with the parent information sessions to ensure that we we could understand where the families were coming from and, and if we were offending in any way, and they were able to speak to us openly about what they felt comfortable with, and that way it was sort of a, a partnership between the parents and us so that we weren't stepping on anybody's toes. The advice um, that I would give other teachers or other schools would be to just get on board. We've all, we've all experienced aspects of, you know, we've all experienced puberty, we've all got a body, we've all got bits and pieces here, there and everywhere. So it's just about getting on board and not being embarrassed about who you are um, and 
you know, these kids find it difficult to talk to maybe parents at times, so we're sort of the next step. And through our surveys, we're able to find that out. So it's just being comfortable and yeah, get on board. Okay, so we've got a few links to make this a successful program. So we've got Bowen Health, we've got the Family Plan in Victoria, the School Nurses, um, and Deakin University. So each month or every two months, we have a meeting with those representatives from the school, our campuses and also those organisations just to ensure that we're all on the same page and running with the most successful program we can. The role of agencies I don't think is ever really um, a clearly defined one in that it depends, depends a lot on the relationship that's been in the past. And Bowen Health has had a very strong relationship over a very long time with all the schools that eventually amalgamated in the area. So they knew me. And that made a lot of difference in their ability to come to us rather than us trying to impose what we thought was helpful on them. Talking about taking your time, um, you need to look at agencies in your area. You need to get in touch with them. If you know somebody, like school nurses are in your school, school nurses are a great resource and you can ask them, who is someone that you might work with to do with sexuality education? So we went to Family Planning Victoria for education um, and they provided it for us. We went to Deakin University who did the surveys for us and we were very, very lucky and not every school teacher will have that. They might have a dad who is actually a statistician and that person might know somebody else. So I think for a teacher, especially in a rural community, that's what I mean, take your time, get to know who is in your area in terms of your agencies, your expertise, and then use what you have. Get them on site, get them engaged, and then don't feel like you're being a bad teacher by asking for that help, because that's what makes you very strong as a teacher. Okay, so just to um, just to finish up, to look at sort of the lessons uh, that that we've learned so far from um, from this project um, in terms of building capacity and developing a whole school approach, it needs to be a school and community partnership, particularly in a community like this, as Susan talked about. It's very low SES, so those resources are really important in terms of uh, helping the school, but also engaging parents and one of the things from the parents survey is that parents would have liked some education so one of the things that came out they would like some education about sexuality themselves they didn't want to be teaching their kids but they would like some um, some education one of the key things what, what was really interesting is that the key issue that came out from the students that they wanted to know more about love and and so and there was a really similar uh, pattern for um, the parents as well. That same issue has emerged now with our data from um, 2,500 young people in Victoria and South Australia in years 8 to 10. One of the key issues they want to know about is love too. So, um, and we know that that's often not covered uh, in our classes. We need to take a long-term view. And some of the research I'm doing now in respectful relationships, the principals are saying five years which has been our experience. Five years to bring about whole school change because part of that is actually bringing about cultural change. You've got to bring about... Schools and teachers need to see that sexuality education is important. We know that it's always had a low priority, but we know that issues that fit into sex and relationships education can be crucial to kids being able to learn if they're suffering abuse, or if they're struggling around issues to do with their sexuality, um, their, uh, or a relationship breakup, or think uh, that they're very important issues. Also, it needs to be participatory and a consensus model, and that was really important um, uh, at Northern Bay uh, that it was a, a um, that the teachers in particular were involved in the process. They had a say and, and that they had a chance to come along and it was a partnership. They weren't, it wasn't mandated. Um, the champions were really important, but it was not, it had to be not only top, top down, 
so leadership, but it had to be bottom up. So that's where, you know, we had to hear the voices of the teachers, the students and the parents, as well as what the leadership what was wanting um, as well. A team, ha having a team, and look, one of the um, that one of the amazing things about that working party was that Mel, who you um, saw there, now she did not want to teach sexuality education when she started. You know, that's that's why she's such a wonderful illustration of capacity building. She was scared. I don't want to teach. I'm really uncomfortable. But once she works through the process, she's now a champion. She, she coordinates the whole thing across this college and that's not where she saw herself uh, five years ago. Um, as I said, that's the next point. Teachers need to be leading this. So it needs to be a commitment by the teacher, teachers, not just the leadership. Uh, staff participation, uh, the importance of an action plan. And, and so that action plan had to be reviewed. So originally it was grade five and six, so then it was reviewed. Um, and originally it was called a curriculum project, but in the end that they changed the name of it to community to acknowledge that it need, needed to be a community engagement project. I can't emphasise the importance of, of evidence. No, look, I was going to give you a whole lot of graphs and I thought, oh, I'll be here all day if I start showing you all the data. Um, Oh, that'll bore you. I was worried about it boring you anyway. But um, uh, so, and look, the, developing a common understanding of what we're talking about, and that's why going to a definition around sexuality is really important because what you might think sexuality education is can be really different to what I, I see it as, and and enabling um, people to move beyond that sort of harm harm approach. Um, planned implementation, you have to give it time. It has to take uh, a, a, you know, at least two years before uh, you actually start teaching it. So that's a long time when you think about the lead time, but, but that enables the staff to come along, it enables data, it enables the parents, it enables the profile, the, the whole lot. Um, importance of ongoing research and a public profile, because once once there is a public profile ab about the work going on in schools, well, it helps the parents who may be feeling uncomfortable because the other people view this as really important. So, where to from here? As I said, we're about to. Um, so next time, um, next time I, I uh, talk to you, it may be about the what happened five years on. So, um, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deb. We've got time for a couple of quick questions, if anyone's got a question. I just wanted to ask what changes the, the data at this stage is showing as far as changing practice and better outcomes? Uh, at this stage, um, if we go back, there is now, um, as I said, there's a, a program now in um, from prep uh, to, to year 10. Uh, one of the key, one of the most wonderful things, I was talking to the principal a couple of weeks ago and they had a very bad inc incidence around um, uh, pornography, you know, where somebody had sent a nude picture, you know, classic sort of stuff that we know is going on in schools. And the, the police came out to talk to the kids. And, um, and the, the, the police officer said to Ken, uh, the principal, I've never been in a school before where kids have been so mature. So these were secondary students, so so mature that they didn't even flinch when we talked about penis, vagina and those sorts of issues because these kids have been having sexuality education now. So if they're in year 10, they've now had it from grade six. So it, so that it was really comfortable. One of the other issues that came out, because we've been collecting data along the way, and it was interesting, we... Uh, we did a survey of all the Year 9 students to plan their program. And what was interesting, have you all seen the national schools data around sexting and the, the data was exactly the same. The kids were engaging in exactly the same uh, level of sending nude photos, sending texts and, and the school just went, what? You know, and I had to reassure them that this is consistent with the national data, so that impacted then on the sort of program that they implemented for their Year 9 students. So uh, we're only just starting to collect the data. I mean, I can talk about anecdotal things, but until we've got 
you know, that data. Uh, the only thing that did worry me, we, um, I had a group of students which are part of looking at the data for the um, ARC research this week and we had a group from Northern Bay. They have very, very low literacy levels so um, it's quite sort of uh, challenging. They were year, nine, year 10 and um, 11 students um, and uh, I guess for some of them, you know, they had been doing the classic stuff that what they remembered were things around SDIs and pregnancy. So I didn't really see much evidence of um, some sexual pleasure in there, unfortunately. But, so it'll be interesting to see what we find. With this, are you intending to follow on the kids as they get older? Because ultimately that's what we want to see. Are we making them, you know, better adults? Or the fact of their choices as they become adults and into that risky area? Look, one of the things that the principal was very keen to do, that's why he wanted to wait to year five. So when we survey all the kids, some of those students, we will have the early data and to see whether there's been a change. But it's like one of the issues for us in any area of health education, you know, we can't measure behavioural change. You know, we can sort of look at some sort of attitudinal change over a five-year period. But yeah, you will have that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 well, we will have yeah, that, that sort of data. But as I said, it is such a low uh, SES area and the um, teenage pregnancy is, is a real issue for those young people. And we know for, uh, as you people probably do yourselves, you know, the research shows that you know, for, for young women in those sorts of communities, babies are really important. You know, they give them something to love, something nobody can take away. So it's very hard to deal with those cultural things. And so the school's taken a different view and it's provided a crash. And, and the school also had this um, philosophy of the promise. They have a promise to their kids. If they stay on, they will enable them to, to, to do some, something productive. And the university, this is just one project we work with, but our Deakin University has a, um, a, a, a very um, involved project with the school to, to try and um, bring that about. Um, you just mentioned the crate. What other considerations and changes did you make? You... <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for mentioning the crate. I just wanted to know what other considerations and changes you may have made to um, include or accommodate for cultural and li religious diversity? Look, that, that has been a challenge, and one of the challenges that the school has found, you know, the school has found, is engagement with the parents. And so, um, as much as they implement strategies to try and do that, it's very hard to, to get the, um, the, the parents involved to, to even explore some of those issues. So one of the things we've done in terms of now collecting this data, we've um, uh, got an RA who's from the community. Um, she, she's actually an ex-principal, so she's very skilled in terms of those sorts of things. And she's going to uh, work with us, with the parents, to, to, to find out some of those um, answers. Look, the, the parents are overall extremely supportive. Kids have not been withdrawn. Uh, in Victoria, we, you, you don't have to, you know, there's no signing and, um, you know, to do sexuality education. It's part, part of the curriculum. But if you want to withdraw your children, you can. But you need to come up and talk to the school. So any examples of that is that the parents have spoken to the um, school and they've felt comfortable. When we ran the uh, parent information nights, there was one particular campus where there, she was a young parent and she was livid about us dealing with issues around um, sexual abuse, for example. And so, so the school worked uh, with her and her problem was that she had been sexually abused herself. So she had to feel comfortable that, that the school was not going to, um, uh, you know, that, that those issues were going to be dealt with sensitively. So, which is why, you know, consulting with parents is so important. Uh, there was a lot of really great recent uh, references that you used in there. Uh, would you be able to supply that reference list um, afterwards? Absolutely. Look, and I can give you another presentation. Uh, I took two slides out last night that had uh, that, um, a whole lot of references around capacity building because I thought, oh, you would probably be... So I, I changed it, you know, I put the lessons learned. Well, that was a couple of slides that used references, but it's getting to the target audience. I didn't want you to go to sleep on me, but I'm really happy to provide that. Um, some of the research I thought pointed out that some young people prefer 
or like to have education from those that are a little bit older, but not necessarily their parents or grandparents' age. Did you have any sort of peer education or peer education programs as part of that whole school approach? No, the school didn't. No, they didn't. They, the young people were involved on the working party, but no, they haven't. They and haven't. One other question. Um, some of the research, that Latrobe research I'm quite familiar with, mm. I teach from an external perspective, mm. sexuality education, um, talks, it, it talks about 85% looking to the internet to supplement mm. or, or go, go to it for, edu for sex ed. Mm. Some of those students perhaps are doing it to keep anonymous and remain anonymous because they have no, their teachers know their parents and they want to ask certain questions or find out about certain topics that they don't necessarily want to broadcast in a classroom. Did you have any kind of sort of outlet for those kids that wanted like a more anonymous but, but academic sort of um, based education, if you like? Uh, no, in terms of the school, uh, it's, you know, and I guess, you know, Archer's research, you know, obviously identifies that um, yeah, the, the source of information young people want most of all is school-based programs, but they want to be anonymous in it. So, and the, hence the importance of providing um, appropriate um, information. Uh, as I said, they're very low literacy levels of, of these kids, so you may find in a more middle class school that that may be the case. At this school, the internet's really being used for pornography uh, as, um, as a source. And this afternoon, in my summing up, I'm going to sort of talk about the, the, that issue as a, as a challenge um, because we do need to be providing young people with access to accurate information, for example, about sexual practices without accessing pornography. And that's my experience going mm. in is, and I hand out the Get the Facts while it comes. Mm all the kids because I'm saying it's like a needle in a haystack. If you don't feel comfortable asking someone, at least go to this academically research-based site for your answers. Well, they get that sort of information. Um, they get that sort of information in the classroom. Another project I'm working on is a Doctors and Teens project. It's a re researching it. So in Victoria, I don't know if you have it here, it's a program that some of the schools have implemented in Victoria where doctors go in for two sessions and it's around connecting them to their services. So that's been really interesting talking to the young people because there are some things that young people would like to talk to the doctors about rather than the teachers. Um, One last quick question. Just very quickly, Jack. How does the school um, handle um, disclosure by students in the classroom of sexual abuse? And, and is that incorporated into the whole school culture? You know, is it yeah, absolutely cru crucial uh, question. So that is included in the whole school approach. So teachers know the um, the process. That there are very uh, so one of the things they did in their PD is around protective interrupting. You know, so and they have you know they they their class rules. Um, and one of the reasons why the classroom teacher is so crucial is in this context because it's what happens in the playground, what they find, it's not, they don't get the, the disclosure in the sexuality education classroom, it's while yard duty's on and, and you know, little Deb comes up and, you know, says to Mary, oh, I want to talk to you, miss, you know, so that they have, and that's where they have wonderful connections to uh, the community agencies and that's where the role of the agencies are so crucial to support the work of the teacher because the teacher's role is around pedagogy is around teaching and learning assessment um, and so they need support if things uh, emerge. They don't have time to go off to do this, that and the other thing uh, as well.